La Plata County Sheriff Duke Sherrard demands an apology from his opponent during a local candidates forum. Pioneer Olga Little tells us what it's like to be a jackwhacker and the Metropolitan Opera sings its way into Durango over the internet. These stories and more on this special anniversary edition of Inside Durango News. This portion of Inside Durango News is brought to you by the Payroll Department. Providing La Plata County businesses with personal, professional, and accurate payroll services since 1993. I'm Ashley Dixon with Inside Durango News, coming to you from the Powerhouse Science Center here in downtown Durango, Colorado. November 2014 election ballots began arriving in the mail this month, and candidates for La Plata County offices have been hitting the campaign trail seeking your votes. And if their comments at the recent League of Women's Voter candidate forums are any indication, this year's election is a vote for experience. That was the theme that predominated the League of Women's Voters forum held on October 9th in Durango City Council Chambers. Whether it was incumbent Sheriff Duke Sherrard who pointed to his 20 years in office, or Cynthia Roebuck who cited her involvement with land use planning and nonprofits, every candidate said their experiences uniquely qualified them for their respective offices. Roebuck, the Democratic candidate for county commissioner in District 1, called on her experience as a land use and development planner with Durango Mountain Resort, Edgemont Highlands, and other developments as the reason to vote for her. My business experience as a land use consultant for the last 15 years makes me uniquely qualified to serve you all. I've lived and raised my family in La Plata County since 1981. More importantly, I've worked with people across the county on land use planning, permitting and licensing issues. I know what works for individuals and businesses and what doesn't. La Plata County faces tough budgeting decisions. I believe that by applying modern technologies and best management practices, we can streamline our expenses and still provide quality services to our citizens. Roebuck said she would simplify the county land use code, but would ensure that strong regulations are in place to protect the health, safety, and welfare of its citizens. Roebuck's Republican opponent, Brad Blake, said his experience running a family plumbing business qualified him for the commissioner job. We enjoy calling La Plata County home and that's why I'm interested in running for office as commissioner here because I feel it's important to have a good uh, conservative voice here in the county for the people of the county and I also feel that it's important to have a good business sense on the commission. I think it's good to have business sense, common sense and good ideas to move the county forward and to make help make the people in the county prosperous. Blake said existing county planning regulations are cumbersome and bad for business. He'd streamline processes and change other regulations to make La Plata County more business friendly. In a rare but hotly contested race for county treasurer, a longtime local and a relative newcomer hope to win the vote of confidence. Republican Bobby Lieb, who currently serves as County Commissioner for District 1, cited his current experience as an elected official and his work as Executive Director of the Airport Business Park and Durango Chamber of Commerce. His family formerly owned Durango Threatworks, and Lieb has served on the La Plata Electric Association, San Juan Basin Health, and Fast Track Communications Board of Directors. My current, my career path has been uniquely visible in this community, and so for many of you, you're already aware of my successes and competencies. This makes me especially qualified to serve as treasurer because I'm the only candidate who can claim both business and government work experience. Lieb's opponent, Democrat Allison Morsi, said her 10 years in the finance industry, 10 years with Microsoft, and 10 years working with the oil and gas industry gives her the strategic thinking experience that will improve the treasurer's operations. When I decided to run, I committed to knocking on 6,000 doors. Well, over the last five months, I have traversed the county and knocked on 6,500 doors. And what I learned from you is that you really want somebody who cares, somebody who is honest, somebody who has the nuts and bolts experience of running the county treasurer's office. And I do have the accounting and finance background. I've got 10 years of accounting and audit experience, mostly in banking, which is the most important partner for the treasurer's job. But we also need strategic thinking, process improvement, 
and technology experience, and those I bring to the job. While the commissioner and treasurer races have remained civil and almost overly polite, La Plata County Sheriff incumbent Duke Sherrard's demand for an apology from his opponent illustrated his frustration over recent news coverage of 30-year-old allegations of domestic abuse. Both Sherrard and his two ex-wives had deni have denied allegations. Sherrard blamed Democratic candidate Sean Smith, who also works as a deputy in the sheriff's office, for dredging up the old news to taint his reputation. In Sunday's Durango Herald, Sergeant Gary Parsons of the Durango Police Department, one of Sean Smith's known political supporters, made accusations that I committed heinous acts of domestic violence against my ex-wives. In Tuesday's debate at the Chamber of Commerce meeting, you, Sean Smith, acknowledged a part in this defamation. Well, today in the Herald, those ex-wives of mine denied these allegations, condemned the accusers, and expressed support for me in this rage. I urge all the ladies here and in La Plata County to read these letters in today's Durango Herald. Sean, my ex-wife has rinsed all the mud off of me. But Deputy, that mud's still on you. I think you owe my ex-wives and families a sincere apology. But Smith said it was the Durango Herald that stirred the pot, not he, and that Sherrard's reaction points to the need for new leadership in the sheriff's office. What I'd like to tell you is the sheriff and I had a very ugly meeting um, a few weeks ago when this topic came up for the first time. At that meeting, I showed him um, that I was in possession of the reports that the Herald had published in the paper, but that I had read through them and, and didn't find them um, criminal in nature, but that I found that they were somewhat ugly in terms of thing, the way things had functioned in his family life. Um, I told him I was done with it at that point, and I was. This was a dead issue until the sheriff went into the, the editorial board of the Herald and made this public and brought his family back into the situation. Um, my, what I said at the previous debate was that my role was this big because I was interviewed in that article. There, was, there has been numerous, numerous false accusations made against me and my family and they were repeated against my wife in that particular article. That is a distraction from what this race is about. We should not be talking about um, these distractions, we should be talking about exactly what we just did over the last several minutes, and it's our vision for the future of the Plata County Sheriff's Office. Thank you. Okay. In their responses to lead questions, Smith called for a change to what he called a culture of complacency in the Sheriff's Office, while Sherrard repeatedly said that the law enforcement agency is noted for its excellence under his leadership. Sherrard has a long career in La Plata County law enforcement. He's worked as a sheriff's deputy before serving as the Bayfield Town Marshal for eight years. He's seeking his sixth term as sheriff and said his 20 years in office qualifies him for re-election. And I've been your sheriff for 20 years. I've tried my best to serve you people admirably for 40 years. And not only that, my family has served this county in other ways. We donated 2,500 acres between Hay Gulch and Cherry Creek into a conservation easement that can never be subdivided to guarantee that that wildlife corridor from the La Plata Mountains down is held in perpetuity forever. That is a commitment by me and my family to this county. Smith has 20 years of law enforcement experience and has served on a number of community committees, including the La Plata County Children, Youth and Families Master Plan, the Criminal Justice Coordinating Committee, and he has developed three alternatives to incarceration programs. Smith called himself a community-oriented police officer. Why do I want to be sheriff? Because I have a passion for the sheriff's office. It's a passion that uh, has guided a lot of the processes that I've been involved in from the Children, Youth and Families Master Plan uh, to the Sheriff's Youth Advisory Council, uh, developing the alternatives to incarceration program for the sheriff's office and bringing in the first integrated public safety software system in this county uh, involving fire and law enforcement. Uh, I've been given a chance to work on a lot of projects that have made differences in people's lives and uh, that's why I'm here. In addition to the sheriff, treasurer and commissioner races, seats for county clerk, assessor and surveyor also are up for for election. Incumbents are running unopposed. Larry Conley will remain as county surveyor. Craig Larson will serve another term as county assessor and Tiffany Lee Parker will continue on as county clerk. A special thanks to the League of Women Voters, the City of Durango and CitySpan 10 for providing footage of the forum for this broadcast. You can watch the full forum on CitySpan 10 
at durangogov.com or borrow DVD copies from the Durango Public Library. Next, we're moving on to our business news segment with Monty Grushkin. Thanks, Ashley. I'm Monty Grushkin with your business news. We're happy to announce that this week's edition marks the first anniversary of Inside Durango News. Our first broadcast aired Thursday, October 17, 2013, and we've been faithfully bringing you local news ever since. Inside Durango TV was founded in 1983 by Fort Lewis College graduate Rich Fletcher. He built the station through Animus Media. He later sold the production company to John Truesdale, who sold it to Durango business owner Lori Sigalito in spring 2013. Sigalito renamed the production company Fast Forward Media, hired new staff, and launched the new programming model last fall. In addition to Inside Durango News, Fast Forward Media has developed a number of programs, including Go Play Outside, Sports, Historical Features, and other programming that highlights the lifestyle, culture, history, and current events that make Durango and Southwest Colorado what they are today. Thank you to our viewers. We've grown dramatically during the past year. You can watch us on Durango Cable Channel 15 at Durango Mountain Resort, the Glacier Club, and on DurangoTV.com. Viewership has virtually doubled to more than 7,000 views a month, and viewership continues to grow by nearly 20% from month to month. Thanks, Southwest Colorado, for watching Inside Durango News and Inside Durango TV. We're proud to be your only local television station, and we look forward to bringing you another year of local content that matters. Up next, weather trivia with Scotty Smith. I'm Scotty Smith with this week's weather trivia. Do you know the difference between climate and weather? Stay tuned for an explanation later in this program. For now, you're up to the minute weather forecast. This portion of Inside Durango News has been brought to you by the Payroll Department, providing La Plata County businesses with personal, professional, and accurate payroll services since 1993. chamber gave me the chance to meet the vendors I needed. The chamber allowed me to connect with community leaders. The chamber has given me the tools that I need to grow my business. We are the chamber. And we are waiting to connect with you. Connect and grow with the chamber by calling us or visiting us on the web. This portion of local news has been brought to you by Alpine Bank. Locally owned, locally operated. Alpine Bay. I'm Ashley Dixon with Inside Durango News coming to you from the Powerhouse Science Center here in downtown Durango, Colorado. A new state law that became effective on August 1st requires undocumented immigrants to obtain a Colorado driver's license if they intend to drive. But it's proving to be more difficult than expected for Durango's undocumented residents. That's because the nearest Department of Motor Vehicle Office authorized to issue driver's license for undocumented immigrants is in Grand Junction. Durango's Los Compañeros, a resource center for documented and undocumented immigrants, has come to the rescue. The organization plans to provide free transportation for up to 31 passengers at a time to Grand Junction this month and next. The free ride is just one of the many services that Los Compañeros offers immigrants living in the Four Corners. Los Compañeros Executive Director Nicole Mosher says it's difficult to determine how many immigrants are living in the area because the census doesn't count immigrants who are living illegally in the country. She does know that Los Compañeros served more than 500 immigrants last year and the nonprofit organization is well on its way to serving more this year. Immigrants here in Durango are from Mexico, the Ukraine, Africa, and Indonesia, and more. They come to find a better life for themselves and their families, and getting a driver's license opens up job opportunities. Last year, the legislature adopted a new law that will allow undocumented immigrants to obtain a driver's license. So another bill that passed was the driver's license for all bill. It's actually called the Community and Road Safety Act, and that makes it so that immigrants, whether documented or not, are now eligible to obtain a Colorado State driver's license. And this is, of course, benefit to the entire community because uh, right now, there, I believe some, there's over 40,000 immigrants in Colorado who are eligible now because of this law. So if you think about 40,000 people driving without valid state driver's licenses, that's a problem for the whole community in the whole state. So um, 
that's something that is really eminent now because the um, law took effect August 1st and so we have received dozens of inquiries um, and calls and walk-ins asking for what are the requirements, how do I apply, um, you know, what, how will my status um, affect this and, you know, basically they're saying I want to be able to drive legally and, um, and so this is great for the whole community because they'll have insurance, they'll, they, they won't have a problem getting insurance and they will be able to afford um, you know, to get a license and, and be driving safely on our roads. The state will administer driver's license to undocumented residents at one of only five DMV offices in the state, and none are in Durango. In addition to some of Durango's undocumented residents have made the trip to Grand Junction only to be turned away because they didn't have all the appropriate paperwork. And the paperwork is extensive, Masha said. Undocumented residents have to show proof of residency for two years, show that they've paid income taxes, present a valid ID, and they have to pass the written and driving test. Compañeros is really trying to ensure that these folks have all the proper documentation, that they um, know what the requirements are, and that they don't waste their own time or money or anyone else's going to an appointment without being fully prepared. Immigrants who have legal visas may go to the DMV office in Durango to obtain their license, but undocumented residents face the heavier burden of traveling to Grand Junction, a burden that Los Compañeros and other immigrant advocacy community groups say is unfair. So Compañeros was thinking, this means hundreds of people will be driving without valid driver's licenses over mountain passes five hours to get to Grand Junction to be able to do this. And we thought that if we could facilitate taking groups with people who have driver's licenses to drive them there, that that would be a better uh, scenario for everyone. And um, the challenge was getting appointments. Um, fortunately, I was able to talk with the people uh, who make the appointments at the Grand Junction office and they blocked out an entire day for me to bring a group of 31 individuals up there to take their test and, and to hopefully pass the verification process. If you'd like to help Los Compañeros with its transportation program for undocumented residents, log on to the organization's website at compañeros.info for more information. Up next, we've got Jordan Alexander with our top sports story. This portion of local news has been brought to you by Alpine Bank. Locally owned, locally operated, Alpine Bank. Tad Brown always had a love for pizza. He dreamed of opening his own restaurant. It all started with a small joint on the corner. Then Alpine Bank entered the scene to help Tad's dream become a success story. And before long, Tad moved to a space large enough for a hundred hungry customers. As a father of two boys, Tad stays plenty busy, but banking with Alpine Bank means he spends less time on finances and more time making, well, pizza. Alpine Bank, located in downtown Durango and Three Springs. This week's sports news from Durango and further afield brought to you by Mercy Regional Medical Center. Inspiring health. Fort Lewis College football have sent shockwaves around the Rocky Mountain Athletic Conference with a huge upset on Saturday afternoon. The Skyhawks battled with both a vicious rain and hailstorm and the nationally ranked number two team, CSU Pueblo. Heading into the game, the Thunderwolves held a 42 game regular season win streak, which began way back on October 23, 2010, nearly four years ago. But the Skyhawks took no heed of the mammoth they faced and upset CSU Pueblo 23 to 22 in arguably the most thrilling game Ray Denison Memorial Field has ever seen. FLC drew first blood when Jordan Doyle threw a 19-yard pass to Jordan Gillen to complete a 9-play and 75-yard drive. Kip Castana converted for the extra point. The Thunderwolves barked back four minutes later after Josh Bredel returned a fumble for 80 yards, and Pueblo took the lead to end the first quarter up by three through a Greg O'Donnell field goal. Less than two minutes into the second quarter, Austin Shaw retrieved Doyle's fumble in the end zone to put the Hawks up 14 to 10. The Thunderwolves relied on O'Donnell's foot to get back into the game he scored two field goals, once on the 10 minute mark and the second within a minute of the halftime whistle. But as much as Pueblo pushed and searched for a way to control the game, the FLC football team continued to park the bus right in front of their offense. The Skyhawks scored the only points in the third to take the lead by 17 to one through a Castana field goal. Pueblo looked to be the victors through a four yard touchdown with just 10 minutes left to go up by five. 
But even with a two hour lightning delay, the FLC fans wheeled their team on, culminating in a five play and 26 yard drive for Jaquil Thomas to catch the ball in the end zone and give the Hawks a one point lead with just three minutes remaining. FLC pinned Pueblo in their own half and the scope of the victory was captured with the FLC fans storming the field at the final whistle blew. The win comes just a few days before FLC's big nationally televised homecoming game against Mines. Talk about carrying momentum. Durango High School Demon Soccer shared similar celebrations after they put themselves on the cusp of clinching the Southwestern League Championship this weekend. On Saturday, Coach Dalen Parker's team took on Grand Junction and secured their seventh back-to-back -back win. Standout freshman Eli Fenton got the ball rolling on the five-minute mark, which gave Durango the breathing room to express themselves and play the possession soccer that Coach Parker has implemented. On the 34-minute mark, senior Tony Williams capitalised on a flurry of good possession to double the Demons' advantage and leave them in control of the game at half-time. After the break, the two goal scorers combined again for Williams' second goal. Fenton squared the ball across the box for his strike partner to bury in the back of the net. Grand Junction never backed down and their persistence was rewarded with a consolation goal through Cole Barton. But a consolation goal was really all it was as Nick Jernigan got his name on the score sheet in the latter stages of the game. Final score, Durango Demons Boys Soccer 4, Grand Junction 1. The win moves the Demons to 12-2 and, and 1 overall, and 7 wins and 1 in the Southwestern League. Saturday's game acted as a DHS senior day. Coach Parker and his team are confident that the playoffs will bring Durango more high school soccer action. Now here today with me, we have... Well, Dave Presler, thank you for joining me today. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you. So, as the athletic director for Durango High School, what's happening? with the athletics right now? Well, we have a lot of things yeah. going on, obviously. At this time of the year, we've wrapped up a couple programs. Mm -hmm. uh, we're in the process of the second half of the season in some, uh, and in some are actually getting ready to actually go into postseason play. So, yeah. But we really do have a lot of stuff going on right now. Yeah. And how many teams is there that you manage? Uh, well, I mean, if, just in the fall alone, we got eight of them right now uh -huh. going on. So oh. that, and that that's a lot of them. And, and, and probably if you consider all the other activities and stuff that we have going, it, that, that multiplies by twice that amount. Yeah. So we, uh, Durango High School is a busy place. Yeah. Uh, we have a lot of kids involved in activities and athletics, yeah. and, which is a wonderful thing. Uh, we're getting close to 80% of all of our student populations involved in something, wow. which we're really, really excited about. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, no, it's a busy time yeah. uh, for the Demons right now, we're happy about that. Yeah. So with the teams that have finished already, I know softball's finished, golf, golf had a really good season, the boys golf. They sure did. Yeah, yeah I, we have three programs that have finished at this point in time. We have softball. Yeah. Uh, softball program led by Chelsea Rodriguez ended up at 8 and 11, had a, a strong season, yeah. just missed the playoffs, mm -hmm. literally went down to tiebreaker format to whether we we're going to make the final show or not, and we just bought third or fourth criteria on the tiebreaker, we yeah. lost out. Uh, uh, tennis finished this past weekend. They finished the season as well, and uh, real strong season there. We're 4-4 four, four in duels. Yeah. We had two young men that were able to participate in the, the boys' tennis championships uh, this past weekend, uh, and we're pretty excited about that. Mm -hmm. uh, golf uh, had, had really a stellar season. Golf was led by Kurt Rawls, and Kurt did a wonderful job. He has a program going. Our golf program has over 30 kids in it right now. Uh, we're young. Yep. Uh, we had four uh, young men that represented us at the state tournament. Um, I, I, let me back up. They actually had four young men that actually represented us all year long. They were region champions once again, which is a very strong finish uh, there. Uh, all four of them went on to state. Mm -hmm. We end up seventh in the state of Colorado in 4A, which is really a That's strong finish. Mm -hmm. And the good news is all four of those young men are back next oh, year. Great. So uh, really great to have that shake out. Excellent. Uh, and I do want to give a uh, Quick shout out to Dave uh, Weisfeld as well on the tennis side. Yeah. I did a great solid, solid year as well. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So with the teams that are still going now, I came down and watched the homecoming um, for the football game. They had a great game and that's that program keeps going stronger and stronger. Yeah, I mean, and obviously this is an interesting year for us because mm -hmm. with Chassa reclassification every two years, mm -hmm. we, you know, we actually are in a new football conference. Mm -hmm. So our conference is made up of new people we haven't mm -hmm. seen before. Yeah. Uh, primarily Colorado Springs School. That's so the Pikes Peak League. That's yes, the yeah. Pikes Peak yeah. League. That's correct. Uh, our current record uh, is three wins and four losses. Mm -hmm. We, you know, lost a couple tough ones. Uh, we're in the middle of really a tough league right now. Um, this coming weekend, uh, actually on Friday, we we play uh, Pine Creek, which is really a strong team. They were last yeah. year's 4A champion. Uh, they're in our league. Uh, they're currently 2-0 in, in our conference, mm -hmm. so they're going to be extremely a solid, solid program. Yeah. Uh, we finish up the next two weekends after that with Air Academy and Rampart High School, both, again, two more schools yeah. uh, from Colorado Springs area. 
Uh, but I think Dave Vogt and the whole program, they're, they're going to battle with everyone all the time yeah. uh, and obviously working real hard to develop a real solid, real positive program. Of course. And lastly, let's talk about soccer. Just before you came on the show, I told the audience all about the soccer team. I mean, they're 12, 2 and 1 right now. <laughs> they're doing great. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and we have the, this week off, actually. Some of the other league teams are finishing up this week. We're going to find out where we, where we land uh, come Sunday. Chasta mm -hmm. seats the tournament on Sunday afternoon we'll know then yeah. uh, whether we get to host or we are very specifically we're host for a top eight seed hopefully potentially have the, given us the abilities if we win to host at least two rounds deep so we're really excited about that so thank you so much for coming on that was a bit of a whirlwind uh, update for everyone but hopefully everyone paid attention and where could they go to find out the results for certainly our, our website is very positive then there's actually three sites actually our school website they mm -hmm. could go to then go to the chassa website yeah. or you can actually go to max prep so uh, all yeah. three of those are real good positive places to go find any result they want in the state excellent thank you so much for joining thank us. thank you very much after this the business news this week's sports news from Durango and further afield is brought to you by Mercy Regional Medical Center. Inspiring help. Starob is the benchmark for enameled cast iron cookware, marrying the expression of the artisan with culinary imagination to produce the ultimate in comfort food. Featuring a special black, matte enamel interior for non-stick brazing and self-brazing spikes, Staub cookware excels in providing the perfect environment for slow-cooked, flavor-enhanced meals. A wide assortment of interesting presentation pieces and dynamic colors ensure Staub cookware easily moves from the kitchen to the table, both at home and in the finest restaurants worldwide. Next, the business update, brought to you by the First Southwest Bank and the La Plata County Economic Alliance. You're watching Inside Durango TV. I'm Monty Grushkin with this week's business news. Next week, the La Plata County Economic Development Alliance will host the 2014 Economic Summit on October 22nd at the Skyu Casino in Ignacio. Up next, more from Roger Zalneritis with the Alliance. Welcome to the Open for Business Economic Update, presented by the La Plata County Economic Development Alliance. Pioneer spirit, business smart. Hello everybody, hope you're having a great week out there. I wanted to talk to you about an event that's coming up next week. So normally I'm here to tell you about some economic stats. I'm gonna have a little bit more of an informal promotion for the Alliance this week. Next week, Wednesday, October 22nd, at the Sky U Casino in Ignacio, Colorado, the La Plata Economic Development Alliance will be hosting its eighth annual economic summit. Here's the uh, brochure for it. If you wanna take a look at it really quick, it says change, I'll tell you a little bit about that. But a little background on the uh, economic summit. We, this was started eight years ago, as, as I mentioned. It was started by our predecessor organization called LEAD. And uh, it was started basically to remind local governments about the importance of business in the quality of life that our communities have. And that went on for a couple of years that way. And then we began to morph or evolve the summit into more of a focus on what information businesses could have that they could take away and then apply at their offices, whether it's nonprofit, for-profit, government agency, what they could apply the next day. So in other words, it would justify why you would be out of the office for a day. Coming to that summit, you would have something that you could learn and then apply at your business. And that's how we've been running it for the last few years and to a lot of success. Last year, we sold out for the first time ever with more than 300 seats. So this year, we've got a theme of change. There is some change coming up this year and this is not a political statement, I should mention. Change is basically what's going on all around us all the time and it's getting faster and everybody who's in business can feel that and they know it right now. So this is about how you react to change when it's hitting your business or your industry, how you can lead that change and possibly even create it, whether it's for your business or against your competition. So uh, that's what we're here to talk about this year and uh, a couple of things that you want to be aware of too is that not only are we going to have several sessions to help your business out, whether it's talking about how you manage price increases, what's going on to help control health care costs. We're also going to have some things on uh, big picture issues that are affecting our economy more generally. So that's one thing that we're uh, changing a little bit about the summit this year. We're going to have a session about the future of higher education, one about mergers and acquisitions and how your community can benefit from them. That, as you know, is pretty important here in Durango because this year we had both Zooks and Mercury bought by outside firms. So uh, that's a pretty hot button issue here in Durango. We're going to have a lunch presentation from the Federal Reserve talking about the regional economy and uh, what's going on there and what we can expect for economic growth over the next 6 to 12 months. And then our keynote speaker, Dan Epstein, was voted, I think at the age of 27, as Entrepreneur of the World. So um, that's the first time I truly felt old in my life is when I found that out. So he's going to be speaking to us about leading change locally, leading change globally as a business. So it'll be fun to hear from him as well. We'll have a reception afterwards sponsored by our Chairman Circle. 
Um, if you were interested in going and you have not signed up yet, got some good news. There are still some tickets available. Bad news is there's not that many tickets available. We, were, we upped it to 350 attendees this year, but we are getting close to selling out. So if you go to yeslpc.com, that's the Alliance's webpage, yeslpc.com, there'll be a little button that pops up in the lower left-hand corner. Click on that button. It'll take you to the Summit registration page. Uh, you can sign up there. And uh, again, it's Wednesday, October 22nd, down at the Sky U Casino in Ignacio, and I hope to see you there. Roger, Director of the Alliance, signing off. This economic update has been brought to you by the La Plata County Economic Development Alliance. Pioneer spirit, business smart. The Economic Summit is always a great way to connect with other professionals in the community and to learn more about the local economy. A few seats are still available. Register online at yeslpc.com. Silverton, Colorado finally will have its own on-ramp to the information highway. Nearly a hundred local regional, state, and national representatives and politicians gathered in the recently remodeled Silverton School Auditorium to celebrate the arrival of fiber optic cable to the town. The historic occasion was likened to the arrival of the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad in the 19th century and the economic connections it created for the new isolated town. With speeches, skits, and a ceremonial joining of the ribbon instead of a ribbon cutting, the town of Silverton finally joins the modern world. Silverton is the last county seat in Colorado to be connected to the internet with fiber optic cable, and it took 15 years to get it. And in the late 90s, Quest Communications won a $37 million state contract to connect every county in Colorado with high-speed fiber optic networks. Quest made it to every county in Colorado except Silverton. The fiber optic cable stopped at the San Juan and La Plata County line at Cascade. That was in 20, 2003. In 2011, a statewide consortium of public and private organizations called EagleNet received a $100 million grant from the U.S. Department of Commerce as part of the Economic Recovery Act. The funds have been used to connect school districts and other anchor institutions in Colorado, including Silverton. Mike Ryan, president of EagleNet, told the audience that he expected the fiber optic cable to arrive this fall. Final connections to the school district, then the Intratown network, most likely will be completed this spring. He, com he commended the community for its consistent political pressure on state and federal officials to get the fiber optic cable into the town, and in doing so, ensuring the economic future of Silverton. We don't want to take any shortcut just to finish it. We want to do it right because it's not just for tomorrow, it's for many years to come. You've got an abundance amount of technology coming at you. And for all of you that have been involved, you should be very, very proud that you're the pioneers of bringing this information highway into Silverton. Ryan said the arrival of fiber optic cable will offer Silverton dramatically increased opportunities for economic development. In a study of 14 small rural communities that were connected to fiber optic cable, the resulting increase in their collective gross domestic product exceeded $1.4 billion. The Silverton system will be an open access network. That means entrepreneurs will be able to connect to the network to offer local homes and businesses reliable high-speed internet service. And with high-speed internet service, the town can start recruiting high-tech businesses and entrepreneurs who want to live the Silverton lifestyle. Pat Swanger, a former town trustee and co-founder of Operation LinkUp, said the fiber optic network will strengthen the connections between Southwest Colorado communities. Swanger is a co-founder of Operation LinkUp, the campaign to pressure state and federal officials to connect the town. As you connect more and more sites, that power increases. That connectivity between us is the strength of the future of sharing our resources. And it's especially true in our uh, traditional communities like Uray, Telluride, Montrose, Durango. These regional connections are so, so vitally important. Up next, our furry friends. Then Olga Little comes alive for the annual Durango Heritage Celebration. The business update has been brought to you by First Southwest Bank and the La Plata County Economic Alliance. My name is Doug Gunnell, and I run G&G &G Farms, which is a family-owned company. 
here in Center, Colorado. I raise certified seed potatoes. The business started about 40 years ago with my grandfather. Potato production in itself is a very cash intensive, demanding uh, seasonal situation. My farm is branching off into different kinds of varieties that maybe have special special uses and special a special place on the grocer's shelf. I feel that's a way to move my business forward. First Southwest Bank, they're my partner and we, they help me do a lot of good things. I have known my loan officer for many many years and I'm very comfortable with her and one huge thing with South, First Southwest Bank is that I know everybody from the teller to the CEO and president. They don't think they're they don't think they're in an ivory tower. They know who their customer is. They know what it takes to get their customer to where they want to be. And they have the means and the drive and the foresight to know how to guide a customer to his best success and therefore guide their own success as well. This is my there. Southwest Colorado Lifestyles with Ashley Dixon is sponsored by The Wells Group. This furry friend segment is brought to you by the La Plata County Humane Society and Pet House. Help us help them one paw at a time. Time for hands down the best part of our program. It's our furry friends segment with Chris Nelson from La Plata County Humane Society. And today we have four month old Penny, who is just, as you can tell from her sweet face, such a love. And she And behave, she's four months old and she's just chilling. I'm amazed that she's sat here this long. It's been like five <laughs> minutes and she hasn't she hasn't tried to move at all. No, she's very content she's, and she's I think she's like loving the sunshine. Yeah, she's soaking up the rays and posing for pictures and Doing what, doing what puppies usually don't do, which is chill out. Exactly. So this is just a great example of a dog that everyone dreams about. One that's mellow, but she's still got that puppy in her, so you know she can romp and rally with the best of them. She she does. And before we came over here, she has a a roommate in her uh, kennel, and they it's another puppy about her age, not a litter mate, but they were playing and roughhousing and. Uh, Jarnell's going to put some of that video up on our website because she put the GoPro in there and it was just really cool to see them <laughs> being puppies. So she's not, she's a little tired right now. So yeah, that so, might So be, you wore her out before the interview. That's yeah, a good thing. Yeah, and we did our business before we got here. So nice. it's all good. <laughs> <laughs> so you guys have a really big event coming up next weekend. It's the annual Bark and Wine. And this is one of your biggest fundraisers of the year, right? Yeah, it's our biggest fundraiser, bar none. It's this Saturday night from 6 to 9 o'clock uh, p.m. at uh, the fairgrounds. We're really excited this year. The, every year we use the Bark and Wine to fund projects we're doing the next year. In the past few years, we've remodeled our cattery, our dog isolation. We've built an awesome play yard for the dogs, which if you haven't seen it yet, you gotta get over there. It's pretty incredible. And this year, uh, the, the funds are gonna be focused on two of the more misunderstood animals that come to shelters, uh, pit, pit bulls and pit mixes, like little Penny here and uh, feral cats, so, oh. and here we go, we're gonna lose our window. <laughs> well, just talking about pit bulls and kind of the negative stereotype that they bring, she's a partial pit mix, and yeah. what has she done but lick our face since we've been here? She's done nothing, and, and this is, you know, especially when you get them at this age, stuff like this, socializing them, all these people looking at her, petting her, putting her in strange situations, this is what people need to do with all puppies, not mm -hmm. just pit bulls, but uh, they do have a negative stereotype, and. And, uh, you know, do they bite people occasionally? But the number one biting breed every year is never pit bulls. They're usually, like, down on the list, like, 10th. Yeah. It's always poodles, chihuahuas, labradors, golden retrievers, those kinds of dogs that we don't think of being dangerous. But they're the ones that bite more people than, uh, than, than most. And, and pit bulls can be great, loving family pets, and they can sit on your... Your dining room table too, <laughs> and do perfect TV interviews right. as well. So are you going to have a couple of pit bull dogs there, kind of walking around? Yeah, for donations? sure. Penny will be there if she's not adopted by then, and uh, we have I think about 12 in the shelter right now. So there'll be 
There'll be a few of them there that night. Um, and if you go to Bark and Wine, you can have Penny lick your face, right. and it just looks like the most joyous thing to happen ever. Uh, it's, pr it's pretty cool. There's nothing like a kiss from a puppy. Awesome. And so I know you guys do a big silent auction as well. So lots yeah. of things to incentivize people to really get the donations going. We got some cool stuff this year for the auction. Uh, ye just yesterday, we got a, a map that's, that was made in the 1600s. I saw it on Facebook. Yeah, it is incredible. I, I, I want to buy it. It's going to... It's going to have a high minimum bid because it's worth a lot of money and uh, we're hoping to, to raise as much money so we can provide affordable spay neuter for folks that own pit bulls and enrichment, more enrichment programs <laughs> for pitties while they're in the shelter. So, awesome. And as well as uh, some stuff for feral cats because feral cats bring us most of the kittens. Mm -hmm. um, we get over 800 kittens a year and most of those are born from ferals that are having those kittens in your barn or your garage or under your car. People bring them in. We'd really like to help uh, get as many of those guys uh, spayed or neutered so we can lower the number of kittens that come to the shelter and, and have our resources for older animals. So where's the best place for people to go get their tickets? You can get tickets at the Pet House. You can come into the shelter and buy them. Uh, you can purchase them online at lpchumanesociety.org or you can buy them at the door that night nice. if you want. Nice, you can buy yeah, them at absolutely. the door. That's good info. We got food uh, catered by Lost Dog. A bunch of restaurants in town are donating desserts. There's going to be a ton of desserts. The silent auction, we have a, a band that's going to play a little while um, called the Durango Tones. I'm excited to hear that. And uh, yeah, it's going to be a, a fun time as it is every year and we'll raise money for our furry friends. So make sure you go get your tickets for the Bark and Wine. And if you're looking for a new friend in your life, I highly recommend going down to the La Plata County Humane Society. Let Penny here give you some puppy kisses and I guarantee you'll walk away with a new friend. We got plenty more Inside Durango TV coming up next. This Furry Friends segment is brought to you by the La Plata County Humane Society and Pet House. Help us help them one paw at a time. The annual Durango Heritage Celebration held the second week of October commemorates Durango's colorful Victorian history. And the Animus Museum brought Olga Little back to life for the event. Olga Little, a Durango pioneer, is believed to be the West's only jack wagger. A jack wagger is a borough train driver, and Olga used her donkeys and mules to pack in supplies and pack out ore to nearly every mine in the area. Inside Durango TV attended Olga's presentation as played by La Plata County resident Carrie Fossil. So my job was to wrangle the livestock. Hmm. However, the skills I acquired there set me up for the rest of my life. I didn't know it at the time. So we came to Chama and then um, eventually, about the turn of the century, we ended up here in Durango, in Animus City, actually. Papa built a house there. But um, I was a teenager and I started a nice little enterprise. I would go down and uh, meet people at the train depot and take them by buckboard or carriage on tours of the mountains around here. It was a pretty good little tourist uh, business that I had started up. In 1909, we had a horrendous flood. Washed everything out up Junction Creek. Ruby, the Ruby Mine was up there. And one day, um, I met the owner of the Ruby Mine and he said, you're really good with livestock, Olga. You can run a pack train, can't you? And I said, no, I've never done that in my life. I really can't do it. And he said, oh, yes, you can. He said, you can ride a horse. And well, yes, I could. He said, you can ride the horse and lead the pack train into the mine. We're desperate for supplies up there. Olga Little's relatives still live in the Durango area in the Ernie Schaaf family. Up next, weather trivia with Scotty Smith. I'm Scotty Smith, and I am not a meteorologist. But I do know that meteorologists use many terms to describe what happens in the atmosphere around the Earth. Highs, lows, cold fronts, most terms are fairly self-explanatory. Except weather and climate. What's the difference? An easy definition to remember is that climate is what you expect, weather is what you get. Climate is how the atmosphere behaves over a relatively long period of time. Climate patterns are determined by region, and those patterns can be affected by humidity, wind patterns, precipitation, temperature, and atmospheric pressure. Southwest Colorado is best known for its four season climate, but when those seasons decide to unfold depends on the weather. Weather is defined by the conditions in the atmosphere over a short period of time. 
It's the current temperature, the chance of precipitation that day, or wind conditions. It's what you watch on the morning news while you're drinking your morning cup of coffee. While Southwest Colorado climate is relatively predictable, hot sunny days in June, snow in February, rain in August and September, day-to-day -day weather patterns can be unpredictable, especially in the higher elevations. Who hasn't started out on a hike on a warm, sunny morning, only to be pelted with rain and sleet in the afternoon? The only thing predictable about our weather is its unpredictability. So before walking out the door, check the weather for the day, but carry an extra jacket or rain gear just in case. After your up-to-the-minute weather forecast, arts and entertainment with Ted Holty. Southwest Colorado Lifestyles with Ashley Dixon is sponsored by The Wells Group. This is the story of a company that has its roots in Southwest Colorado. A story about two college friends who founded a local business, of their families and the families of their staff, and of generations to come. It's about the concerns we hold, the passions we share, and the bonds that unite us. We are the Wells Group, and for three decades, we've been proud to be a part of the Southwest Colorado community. This portion of Inside Durango News is brought to you by the Durango Arts Center, where Durango creates, promotes, and participates in the arts. We're here at Fort Lewis College as homecoming nears, but we are with a different bunch of Rowdy fans getting geared up for a national broadcast. While the FLC football team is about to take the field for its nationally televised game, this loyal bunch is here in the student union for the season kickoff of the Met Live in HD season. Uh, these are live simulcasts that come direct to us from the Metropolitan Opera in New York City. and for about the tenth of a, the price of what people will pay in the Big Apple to see these opera broadcasts, our local audiences get to see behind the scenes actions shot with multi-camera shoots and uh, it's just a fantastic simulcast. And I'm sitting here with Charles Leslie who is the director of the Fort Lewis College Community Concert Hall, but Charles uh, has to come all the way across campus to the Biocito Room here in the Student Union to handle the opera duties. And uh, Charles, how did this fall to you to do such a thing? Well, um, I knew about the Metropolitan Opera broadcast when they first were started, probably 10 years ago. And when I came to Durango six years ago, I noticed that they weren't happening. And so I started making inquiries to the Met and asking how we could do it. And fortunately, uh, a local movie theater picked them up at the time. However, a couple of years ago, um, the movie theater changed owners, and the new owners decided not to continue offering the, the simulcast, the live in HD. And so um, I reached out to the Met again, and we developed an arrangement so that we could broadcast them here on campus. And we bought the equipment, and a group of community members committed to helping if we needed it and uh, they get the word out and they've it's been great ever since and it's it's surprising to many when we uh, hear that you can actually see these live simulcasts of the Metropolitan Opera and what has the attendance been like I mean they are shown here on Saturday mornings on right. the Fort Lewis College campus and it's been pretty good, hasn't it? Yeah, we can seat almost 170 people, and we average about 100 people per per event. Um, popular operas, you know, like uh, you know Aida and um, La Boheme. La Boheme, for example, from last year. You know, we get huge. That was standing numbers. room only. That was yeah, that's standing room only, and and we've had to actually kind of start monitoring that a little more carefully because they are growing in popularity. We're getting, every year we, we see an increase in attendance. Indeed, and that is not a local phenomenon either. Uh, I think since this series began in 2006, they've uh, sold over 15 million tickets in 66 countries. You know, the right. stats are all out there, but it is a very popular series, and I think we're lucky to have it here in Durango. Well, we're really fortunate um, that we can do it here on Fort Lewis College campus because the Viacito room has uh, a high definition projector, it has Dolby surround sound system. The room is really comfortable, um, and then it gets uh, people to come see. You know, what a great facility we have here. 
Excellent. Well, the season is 10 operas long. Obviously, the Met season itself is much larger than that. But the live and HD season here at Fort Lewis College is uh, 10 performances. Right. I know coming up, we've got uh, The Marriage of Figaro, Ma uh, Mozart's classic, as well as uh, Bizet's Carmen. Right. Those are the next couple ones coming up. So, And we're sitting here on opening day, which is uh, Macbeth. Yeah, Verity's, Verity's Macbeth. Macbeth. Macbeth, you know, which is a spectacular opera. And there's a couple of... Um, famous versions of Macbeth and opera, and this is probably the most famous one. Indeed. Yeah. Well, it is, promises to be another wonderful season here, the, lo the, the Met Live in HD series here at Fort Lewis College. Thank you again to Charles Leslie, not only for joining us today, but for bringing the series here to Fort Lewis. Thanks, Ted. It's my pleasure. Back to you. This portion of Inside Durango News is brought to you by the Durango Arts Center, where Durango creates, promotes, and participates in the arts. Three, two. Thanks Southwest Colorado for supporting Inside Durango News and Inside Durango TV. We're proud to be Durango's only local televised news magazine and we look forward to another year of bringing you local content that matters. I'm Ashley Dixon, coming, uh, wait, let's do that again. <laughs> You're watching. <laughs> I will hold my bladder, I will hold my bladder until this is done. <laughs> Up to the date, minutes, minutes and dates. I just can't wait. I'm Jordan Alexander. It's the. It's just a bunch of niceties around here. We are going to do the news, and it's very exciting. Uh, I, I'm, I can't contain myself, to be honest. I'm, I'm really, really happy.